Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, I am ready for the event. University Prep Charter High School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is University Prep Charter High School. How do you hear me? University Prep Charter High School, I have you loud and clear. Welcome to the International Space Station. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Anand Chancellor. My name is Mr. Shafano. I'm a special education mathematics teacher here at University Prep Charter High School in the Bronx. Welcome to our school and welcome to the greatest borough of New York City. Our students have been grappling with the possibilities of colonizing Mars and they have some questions for you to aid their research and potentially draw some conclusions. Why have Nick, thanks so much. I, I definitely want to give a shout out from uh, my previous expedition crewmate, Ricky Arnold, and his daughter, Carrie. They want me to tell you hello. And Ricky just returned to Earth not that long ago and also says greetings. Ready for that first question. Why have the moon and Mars been a primary focus for NASA as our next goal in space exploration? Well, I'll tell you, I, I honestly see these parts of space exploration as stepping stones, um, starting, of course, here with the International Space Station and then on to the moon and to Mars. And, and the way you got to think about it is, you know, Mars is an awfully long way off. And so... What we've been doing here in low Earth orbit certainly is developing new technologies to make sure that we can sustain ourselves on board a space station for long periods of time. The next step after that would be to try and get to the moon, a place that's not too far away from Earth, where we can continue to test these technologies and even develop a lunar habitat where people can live and work for even longer periods of time. And then after that, once that is established and we're pretty sure about the direction we're headed, then when we know the engineering is sound, we head off for Mars. So I really look at the moon as almost a practice ground. And it is much more than that, for sure. Um, but it is a tremendous place that is very close to Earth um, where we can continue to develop uh, robust technologies for us to even get to Mars. Because... Even every day on board the space station, things break. Technology that we think might work maybe only lasts a couple months, and we've got to revamp and figure out how to make things work better. What role will commercial partners play in the exploration of the moon and Mars? So it's important to know that right now, um, NASA works very tightly with its commercial partners. Uh, we have commercial cargo vehicles coming up and down all the time. In fact, we've got the Northrop Grumman vehicle that is slated for launch tomorrow. Uh, we just released uh, an HTV cargo vehicle not that long ago. Uh, many companies have been working with us every day uh, to help bring cargo safely to and from the station. And very soon, we're going to be bringing people to and from the space station with some of our commercial partners. And I think a lot of folks believe that we work completely separately, uh, but that's not the case. We've got thousands of folks at NASA and thousands of folks at those companies working together to make sure things go well. And I foresee those partnerships continuing as we go to the moon and Mars. There's not going to be one agency across the planet that is going to be able to make these journey, that's going to be able to make this journey alone. Uh, we do it in partnership. So I really foresee our country working with multiple other countries, as well as multiple companies, both nationally and internationally, to make that mission successful. Um, what type of experiments are you conducting on the International Space Station that could help send humans deeper into space? So I think some of the biggest things we do on a daily basis here is really creation of water. So, and what I mean by that is we don't fly all the water that we use up here in the space station. We reclaim as much water from our own station atmosphere, and we even recycle our own urine to create water for the next day's coffee. So just technology like that is extremely important when you think about long duration or expedition class missions, because water is the key to life. What about food? Well, right now we're growing vegetables here on the space station. We're growing some kale and some lettuce. And it's a little different up here because water acts differently due to surface tension forces. So we're learning right now the best way for plants to grow, the best way to water. What sort of nutrients do we need? Do we need soil or can we use 
other nutrients for the plants to grow. And we're doing it on a small scale up here, but we've already proven that we can successfully grow crops. So when we set off for Mars or we set off for that habitat, we can't carry all our food with us. We're going to have to have those technologies already developed so we can begin to grow those crops on the way there so that they're ready. Being that astronauts on the International Space Station are from various countries, how do language barriers play a role in the operations of the station? Yeah, it's funny. So we actually don't see language as a barrier up here. Now, all of us, we get training in the Russian language, and our Russian cosmonauts get training in the English language, and we go back and forth. In fact, if you were to come up to the space station and just listen to one of our daily conversations, you would hear us go back and forth. And very often, I will talk to Sergei in Russian, and he will answer me in English. Um, and sometimes our sentences are mixed, kind of a, a wranglish, if you will. Um, and we kind of see it as an advantage or a benefit, because sometimes there are the words are better in the Russian language than they are in the English language, and we choose to use those. And so it's a lot of fun because it also gives us um, a better opportunity to discuss thing, important things like family and our loved ones at home with our counterparts. So I think if you talk to most astronauts, we really don't see that as a barrier at all. Um, it makes our lives more fun up here. How has training how has your training as a medical doctor helped you and the crew on the International Space Station? So certainly, you know, as a doctor, I'm prepared to handle any sort of medical event should that arise. Honestly, where I felt it's come more into play is by looking at a lot of the science up here. And the number one science experiment that's going on up here is yours truly and my other crewmates, Alex and Sergey. So really studying the human body and what happens to the human body in space is fascinating because once we get up here, the moment we get into microgravity, we have this massive fluid shift that occurs and our, our heads and our faces look a little puffier than they do on the ground. Um, believe it or not, our bones and our muscles begin to break down almost immediately and we have to actively work to counter that every day. The cool thing that happens is you don't get that same rush of blood to your head when you go upside down. So I can talk to you guys on the ceiling. I can talk to you guys on any wall. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect me. So it really, um, my brain almost remodels itself um, to work in this environment. And so it's, I've found that being a physician, um, it just has expanded my knowledge of how wonderfully adaptable the human body is. It can adapt to any environment in any condition. Um, what are some examples of how astronauts use mathematics on the International Space Station? Yeah, so it's funny. We use math in many different ways, both indirectly and directly. Um, something as, as simple as, you know, the other day, uh, Alex, my crewmate, and I, we were looking at some medical devices and actually calculating the volume in the tube to figure out how much fluid could be held because fluids do act differently up here in microgravity. So we use mathematics for that. And if you look at the station itself, orbital mechanics is mathematics. The way our robot arm maneuvers, the way the joint angles are calculated, that's all mathematics. So mathematics is really the key of life um, to the space station. And a lot of times we don't see it directly as the astronaut, but it keeps all of these systems running up here. How does the International Space Station replenish its supply of water and oxygen? Yeah, so water itself, we kind of like I talked about, we have a water recovery system where we reclaim everything from the atmosphere. And so even from our urine that we turn into tomorrow's coffee, uh, sweat, the condensate from my breath, all that is reclaimed um, from the system. Now, oxygen itself is created through our oxygen generation system through electrolysis of water. And so it's really a neat system that we have up here. Um, it was very interesting to me because uh, I had the opportunity to travel to Antarctica about eight years ago. And I realized very quickly that when we were living on the ice, our main concern every day was something we called water balance. And that's what we called it. How much water did we have for people to drink? How much water did we have for daily operations? Did we have to go out and chip the ice to melt the ice to make the water? Up here, it is very much the same. The great part is, is we have some tremendous folks on the ground always looking at that water balance. Like I said, water's the key to life, and so we are always looking at what we may need to add to the system or take away to make sure that the station is in balance at all times. 
How does the research aboard the International Space Station and ex space exploration benefit human life on Earth? Great question. Um, you know, I didn't realize until I got up here some of the experiments I would be doing. We don't get training necessarily on the ground. Sometimes we learn about them once we come up here. There was some tremendous cancer therapy research we did early in the mission, and it turns out that some of the cells that live in your body, that live in your blood vessels, really like to grow in microgravity. They don't grow the same way on Earth. They don't live for very long, but up here in space, they grow really well, and it lets scientists test different chemotherapy agents. Northrop Grumman 10, our Cygnus vehicle that hopefully, knock on wood, will launch tomorrow, is bringing a really cool medical experiment up looking at Parkinson's disease, and it's looking at a very specific protein. And the reason those scientists want to study that protein up here in space is because when Protein crystals grow up here in space, they're much better structured and much better ordered. And what scientists want to know is how to create different drugs to target that protein for Parkinson's disease. And they haven't been able to do that very well on the Earth because it doesn't grow very well. But up here in space, it grows really, really well. And so even as a physician, you'd think I'd know about all these experiments beforehand, but it has been super cool to see these things come up on vehicles and let us test them directly. If given the opportunity, would you yourself volunteer to be among the first to go to Mars? So I've had a lot of questions about what I plan to do after we're done and undock and land. Um, honestly, I have to be honest that I'm totally focused on this mission right now. You know, we still have a long way to go before we're ready to get to Mars, but I feel like my job right now on board the station, besides the fantastic science I've told you guys about, is to help prove that humans do a really good job living up here, um, that we can get through almost any problem, knock on wood, um, that we're prepared to spend long duration periods of time up here, and those get longer and longer every year. We've already had Scott Kelly stay almost up here for almost a year, Peggy Whitson. And I think that by just our presence being up here shows that humans can live successfully in low Earth orbit, and that is going to translate for when we get to Mars. In addition to sending humans to the moon and Mars, what are some other long-term goals for NASA? So uh, one thing I want people to understand, and it's a fantastic question, because not only do we have to send humans to the moon and Mars, we have to send them successfully and with all the tools in place. We, we've already learned that in space that the human body is remarkably adaptable. Moon and Mars are a little different story. Obviously, there'll be more radiation on the moon and even more radiation in the transit trip out to Mars. We've got to think about that problem. We've got some great technology on board, the space station that we use, like I talked about, the oxygen generation system. Um, are those same technologies going to work on the moon and the Mars? And Mars? And so I think part of NASA's job right now is, is you know, certainly getting us out there, but what people forget is it's not just the end goal that we're looking at. All that technology that we develop along the way, like when we got up here and we learned that cell, bod, the body cells love to grow up here and that helps us cure cancer, that is something that we learned on this journey to get to Mars that benefits people right now. And so that's kind of what I focus on uh, as well. I mean, NASA has so many goals out there from human science to earth science to exploration science, but I don't want people to forget that everything we've learned along that journey, and I really consider us only a little bit of the way on that journey because we don't know where that journey is going to end. We have learned so, so much, and it's already benefit fo benefited folks back on Earth. In what ways has technology aboard the International Space Station been able to simulate life on Earth in space? Yeah, so I wanted to ask about this question. So are you asking, are we able to kind of recreate Earth on board the space station a little bit? Yes. Yeah, that would be, so of course you've probably seen movies where they're able to have these Earth rooms and you can go inside and feel like you're in the forest or at the ocean and we don't have that up here. Um, we have small ways that help us remember and recreate life on Earth. Something as simple as movie night where we put up our movie screen and we have a film projector and we have movie candy and the crew gets together. For us, that's our theater. That's how we recreate Earth. Um, you'll spend a lot of crew members, though, in the cupola during the day looking back on their planet. Because just having your planet in sight and in view, being able to see the first snow, 
being able to see, you know, uh, unfortunately, we've been looking at all the fires occurring in California. Um, and so for us, that makes us feel closer to our home planet. Uh, I hope someday virtual reality does come in and we're able to recreate these tremendous virtual reality rooms where you actually feel like you're there. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. How do exercise routines differ from person to person aboard the International Space Station? So the specifics of the exercise routine definitely differs from person to person. We have a, a person on the ground, and they're called our ACER. And those are the folks that look after us while we are up here. And we essentially get exercise prescriptions, just like you get a prescription from a doctor's office. And depending on your height, your weight, and your strength level, they will alter that prescription for you. Now, that being said, every astronaut every day exercises anywhere from two to two and a half hours. We get one hour of aerobic activity, which is either on our treadmill or our exercise bike, and we get one to one and a half hours on our weight machine. And you may think, well, how do weights work in space? I mean, weights don't weigh anything, so how do you generate load? Well, we do that with special vacuum tubes, and we can generate up to almost 600 pounds. So you can name the lift, squats, deadlifts, bench press, shoulder press. We can do it up here, and we do it every day because that's one of those main countermeasures I talked about to prevent that loss of bone and muscle while we're up here. Why is human space exploration worth the risk? That's a very big question. Uh, I think you will get different answers from different people. Part of my answer, my personal answer, kind of harkens back to what I talked about just a few minutes ago, and that's what you learn along the way. Um, certainly, as humans, we are not a stagnant species. We are not meant to stay in one place. We have explored this planet from the very beginnings of time and will continue to explore. And what you learn along the way, what you've developed along the way, is what really brings a tremendous amount of benefit back to Earth at that time. So. We continually have people that push boundaries and ask what's possible and what's not possible. And by pushing those boundaries of, of what's possible, new in inventions, new experiments pop out that we had no idea existed. And so a lot of the technology that's used on Earth right now, even mammogram technology, is stuff that was invented by the space program as we pushed to get this orbiting laboratory in place. And so it's worth the risk because of everything we gain along the way. And, and again, I don't want people to think that all the gain comes right at the end. I'd say the majority of the gain comes right along that journey until we get there. Um, what animals would have the greatest likelihood of surviving on the ISS with humans? Well, I wish I had my two dogs up here because I do miss them quite a bit. But certainly we have had animals on board the space station. We've had mice who have done uh, quite well. We've had bees. We've had spiders. Um, it was very interesting to study the mice because you watch them initially float. And when we get up here to the space station for the first time, we are not very graceful. Uh, we're holding on to everything tightly. We don't know how to use our feet. It's not natural for us to flip our feet up onto multiple walls and work in different directions. It's very, very uncomfortable. But now that I've been up here for almost six months, this is very comfortable. Again, I can work on any surface. The mice were the same way. At first, you saw them flail about a bit, uh, but then become very, very comfortable with their surroundings and float very gracefully. So I think any creature, uh, once they get up here, would learn to do very, very well. Um, that being said, the, the animals that I mentioned are the only ones we've had up on board ISS so far. Dr. Anand Chancellor, this is Principal D'Amato, and I would just like to, on behalf of our student body and our staff and, and our school community, thank you wholeheartedly for taking your time to speak with us today. It's been so inspiring and, and educational, and, and I know that you've made a real impact in these young people's lives. So um, at UPCHS, one way that we like to show our appreciation is by doing a bit of a cheer. So if you'll bear with us, we are. UP. We are. UP. We are. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, University Prep Charter School. It's been awesome. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from the University Prep Charter High School and Station. We are now resuming operational audio content.
Thanks, Houston. That was a lot of fun.